Good evening. My name is Lindsay Self, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Toledo Law Review. On behalf of Toledo Law Review and the College of Law, we welcome you to Finding Friendship in a Contentious Place, a conversation with Obergefell and Hodges from the landmark U.S. Supreme Court case on same-sex marriage. Note cards are available for you to compose questions throughout the event if you choose. After some discussion, those note cards will be collected, and some of your questions may be asked during the question answer section portion of the event. If you need a note, excuse me, if you need a note card, please raise your hand and someone will bring one to you. In the 2015 landmark case, Obergefell v. Hodges, the U.S. Supreme Court declared that same-sex couples had a fundamental right to marry as guaranteed by the Due Process and Equal Protection Clauses of the 14th Amendment. Despite being on opposing sides of one of the most important Supreme Court rulings in recent history, Jim Obergefell and Rick Hodges developed the most unlikely friendship. Tonight, Mr. Obergefell and Mr. Hodges will discuss their unique roads to becoming the named parties in this landmark ruling. With that, I am pleased to introduce our panelists. First, Dean Benjamin Barros. Dean Barros joined the College of Law in July 2015. He graduated from Fordham University School of Law and went on to clerk for Judge Milton Pollack of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York and work in private practice in New York City. Dean Barrows writes and teaches in the areas of property law and theory, regulatory takings, property law reform, and philosophy of science. Next is Beth Seedorf. Ms. Seedorf is a third-year law student at the College of Law and is the managing editor of the Toledo Law Review. She took the initiative in planning and executing this event. Prior to law school, Beth was a middle school social studies and science teacher at the Columbus Collegiate Academy. She received her bachelor's degree in history, summa cum laude, from The Ohio State University in 2014 and plans to practice commercial real estate in Columbus area after graduation. Next is Jim Obergefell. Mr. Obergefell continues his work as an LGBT LGBTQA activist and serves on the board of directors for services and advocacy for LGBTQ leaders and elders, the oldest and largest national nonprofit organization that advocates for and provides services for LGBTQA older Americans. He co authored the book Love Wins. Next is Rick Hodges. Mr. Hodges is an executive in residence and visiting professor at Ohio University and is the director of the Ohio Alliance for Innovation and Population Health. He is a former member of the Ohio House of Representatives and has served as director of the Ohio Department of Health. He earned his master's degree in public administration from the University of Toledo. Last but not least is Associate Dean Rob Salem. Professor Salem joined the College of Law in 1994. He graduated from Toledo Law and is the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion and Clinical Professor, where he teaches the Civil Advocacy Clinic. He is a longtime activist and scholar on LGBTQ civil rights, serving on the board of the National LGBTQ Task Force and General Counsel and board member for the Ohio ACLU. Additionally, Professor Salem currently serves on the board of Planned Parenthood Advocates of Ohio and the Ohio Advisory Committee for the United States Commission on Civil Rights. Please join me in welcoming the participants. So thank you, Lindsay, uh, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, so Jim and Rick, we're going to just, we're going to have a conversation and it's going to be roughly chron chronological. We're going to uh, start with Jim, then go with Rick and talk about the case and some background. But we're going to skip to the end of the story. As Lindsay alluded to, you guys are friends. Uh, that's a pretty unusual circumstance. When you're on the opposite side of a V in a lawsuit, uh, usually it's pretty acrimonious. So just wondering if, just to begin with, you could tell us a little bit uh, about how you became friends, how did this all come about? It really started about two years ago, I think in April, uh, there was an event for Equality Ohio in Columbus, and I was part of that event speaking, and Elena, the executive director, reached out and said, hey Jim, any interest in meeting Rick Hodges? And I thought, well sure, but I was a little apprehensive because I, you know, for me, Hodges was my opponent. But I said, sure, why not? So we met for drinks in the hotel bar and just had a really fun conversation. And that's, that's how it started. Yeah, it's, uh, 
I always, you know, they asked me if I'd be okay meeting with Jim, and I'm thinking, I get to meet a rock star of the civil rights movement. I'm there, you know? <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> so, yeah, we had a great time, and it was fun. Good. And, and we've had, you know, we had the chance to record a story core together, so that was a whole lot of fun. And this is really our first big chance, or first chance to be in a big public event, and it's really fun to be able to do this. So thanks for having us. Yeah, we're glad you're here. Awesome. Well, obviously this case is about marriage, and um, we want to kind of start talking about that. And um, with you, Jim, first, if you could tell us a little bit about um, where you're from and, and, and then how, and, and obviously um, your husband, John, if you can talk about where you guys met and, and that kind of stuff. I was born and raised in Sandusky, um, the baby of six in a Catholic family. So grew up in Sandusky. When I decided to go to college, I moved to Cincinnati, went to the University of Cincinnati. And it was during those years that the closet door started opening a little bit, but I'd slam it door, slam it closed as quickly as I could. And it wasn't until I went to graduate school in Bowling Green that I finally found an environment where difference wasn't only tolerated, it was celebrated. And it was sitting in the back seat of a friend's car on a weekend road trip when one friend driving asked the other two of us, are you gay or straight? And I surprised myself by saying gay. And I came out that day. And John, um, born in Chicago, but his parents were both from the greater Cincinnati area. They moved back to Cincinnati when John was seven. And the first time I met John, I was still in the closet and he scared the daylights out of me because he was this gay man who was so comfortable in his being in his identity, I thought for sure he would look right through me and say, just come out already. <laughs> Second time I met him was at that same bar. It was a campus bar near the University of Cincinnati. And at that point, I had just come out. And because a mutual friend of ours was one of his housemates who invited me to his New Year's Eve party, I went to John's new house for New Year's Eve. And I like to say, I never left. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Let me go so, uh, can you tell us, um, how long were you together? When did you first meet, roughly? Yeah, first time, um, we met the summer of 92, and then it was New Year's Eve of 92 and going to 93 when I went to that New Year's Eve party and didn't leave. So, we were together by the time John passed away, it was just shy of 21 years. Okay. Um, so, many people... Uh, would look at, uh, who haven't followed this issue uh, closely, would look at the litigation about same-sex marriage as starting uh, with the cases that led to the Supreme Court case that we're talking about today. But um, there is a Hawaii case in 1993 called Bear v. Lewin. Um, and uh, it was my first exposure to uh, this issue. It came out right before I started law school and my first year legal writing project uh, involved the case. Um, and uh, as we, we were talking uh, uh, previously, um, you were aware of Bear versus Lewin when it came out. Is that right? We were. John and, I had, John and I had started talking about marriage and how we wanted to be married probably within a year, year and a half of becoming a couple. But we really wanted it to be something that meant something legal. Right. So for us, it, we couldn't have it just be a symbolic ceremony. Now, the, the Hawaii case, we knew that was happening, and we were watching that closely. And in fact, John's stepmother said at the time, if this happens, I'm going to take the entire family out to Hawaii so you guys can get married. Well, that didn't happen. And then that also led into our agreement that until it really meant something, we, we wouldn't just have a symbolic ceremony. We, we would wait. We would only marry if it actually carried legal weight. Right. And so for those of you who, who might not know the history, uh, in Bear versus Lew in the Supreme Court of Hawaii um, ruled in favor of a right to, uh, to marry, uh, but that led to a backlash. There was a constitutional amendment in Hawaii, um, and uh, then it also, I think, kicked off the backlash that led to the Federal Defense of Marriage Correct. Act. Is yep. that right? As well as the state amendment here in Ohio right. and lots of other states. So Jim, with almost all of your relationship predating your marriage with John, can you talk about some of the challenges that you and John faced as a couple? Yeah, absolutely. For me, it always comes down to health. 
John was an, an allergic, allergic asthmatic, and he honestly never thought he would live past the age of 30 because of it. So within two years of becoming a couple, John's breathing had been off for some time. It was springtime, and Mother's Day weekend, we were supposed to be at a wedding on a boat in the Ohio River, and John said, we can't go. I just can't do it, so we stayed home. But he, he went into respiratory arrest at home that night. And on the way to the hospital, you know, I was in a car with John's brother. His mom was in the ambulance with him. We get to the hospital, the closest one, which was maybe a 10-minute drive. And as we're sitting in the waiting room, it hit me. We're sitting in a Catholic hospital. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen when a nurse comes out or a doctor comes out and says, well, you can go back and see John, but it's only family. What are they going to say when I say, well, I'm family. I'm his partner of 20 years, or at that point, whatever it was, two years. And the nurse came out and said he'd been stabilized, and we could go back. And I was really panicked. But when I said I wanted to go back because I was his partner, she didn't miss a beat, took me back. I was able to stand next to his bed, hold his hand, and say, come home. So for us, it was always that fear of what's going to happen in a medical emergency. You know, would I be able to make decisions? Would they talk to me? Would they allow me to see him? Because mm -hmm. that was a very real fear that night. Would I be denied the chance to see John before mm -hmm. he died? Mm -hmm. So that was one of the big things. And then another thing that we came across was John's grandparents bought a funeral plot in Cincinnati. And part of the paperwork the rules they put on that plot was it could only be direct descendants and their spouses. Mm -hmm. Well, John wanted to be memorialized on that plot because he was very close to those grandparents and he couldn't memorialize his mom and her, her boyfriend of 18 years because they weren't married. So we knew we wouldn't be able to be there together, whether we were interred or just memorialized. So even little things like that that a lot of people don't think about. And then jumping forward a little bit, when John was sick, um, did you have any issues with um, FMLA benefits or anything like that? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Right. So as John started getting worse and he was working from home, I worked for the same company, and they were nice enough to okay, and my client did as well, that I could work from home and take care of John, even before hospice started. And when... He, his health was getting to the point where we knew the end wasn't that far away. I contacted my HR rep to say, you know, John, John is near the end and I just can't worry about work. I want to go out on FMLA. And the rep's response was, well, absolutely no problem. When you make that decision, just let me know. So a couple weeks later, made that decision and got back in touch with that same representative and said, I now want to go out on FMLA. And she said, I'm sorry you don't, you don't qualify for it. We can't get, offer you FMLA, but we can offer you a personal leave. No guarantee your job will be here when you come back, but we'll give you that. In essence, it was take this and be happy with it because we don't consider you family. And this was after we had, we had married. And, and how did this make you feel, like knowing that this was what your fate was going to be at the time? I felt like I didn't matter. I felt like our relationship our 20 years together didn't exist. Mm -hmm. I felt like we were being denied so many things that couples across the nation took for granted mm -hmm. and couples across the nation were receiving because of their lawful marriage. We had a lawful marriage. Ohio just refused to acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. So jumping forward, so right around this time, let's talk about your decision to marry. Um, so at the time, John was dying of ALS. And, um, and so in 2013, the United States Supreme Court in U.S. versus Windsor uh, declared that Section 3 of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act was unconstitutional, meaning that the federal government could no longer deny federal recognition of same-sex marriages. Uh, I know you and John had a connection to the Windsor case. Can you uh, talk to us a little bit about right. that? Right. We followed that case, so we knew the decision would be coming out sometime in June, and on June 26, 2013, I was at the dining table working, and John called me into his room, and I stood next to his bed holding his hand as the decision on the Windsor case came out, and that decision struck down DOMA. And this wasn't planned, but just spontaneously, I leaned over, hugged and kissed John, and said, let's get married. Mm -hmm. And luckily, he said yes. 
But for us, this was the first moment in our, in our 20 years together and, you know, in the, that we could actually get married and at least have the federal government acknowledge our existence, say, say our marriage was legitimate and was valued and respected. And that was what we had wanted for so long. So it was just a spontaneous proposal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so as you alluded to, despite the ruling in Windsor, which only affected the federal government, Ohio um, still did not recognize same-sex marriage uh, right. due to a constitutional amendment in 20, uh, 2004, um, which again defined marriage as between a man and a woman. Um, so can you talk to us about the process? So now you're engaged, and in, in, you know, what's the process for you to get married? I know it was a, a really arduous process. No one you to kind of tell us about it. It was. So after John said yes, the very first thing I did was reach out to his Aunt Paulette, his favorite aunt, Aunt Tootie, because years before Aunt Tootie had told us that she thought we represented marriage better than any other couple she knew, and if we ever had the chance to get married, she wanted to do it. So years previously, Aunt Tootie had gone to the internet and clicked the ordain me button. So I called Tootie and said, Tootie, do you remember your, your offer to marry us? does that offer still stand? And she said, absolutely. You tell me when and where I'll be there. Mm -hmm. So now we had to figure out where to go. And I started researching the various states where we could get married. And I eventually got to looking at the, the laws and everything in Maryland. And there was one thing that Maryland did that made this so much easier on John. And my whole goal was to make sure that John was kept safe and comfortable as much as possible in this process. And Maryland was the only place that did not require both people to appear in person to apply for the marriage license. Mm -hmm. One person could go and sign an affidavit saying, yes, I am actually applying for this marriage license, and the other person is on board with this. <laughs> so I went to Maryland, got the marriage license, came home. But then how do we get John there? How do we get John to another state? You know, thought was, well, we could put him in his wheelchair and take the wheelchair minivan, but that would have been really rough and difficult on him. Same thing with an ambulance. And I couldn't take him to the airport to fly on Delta or American, so that left for us a chartered medical jet. Mm -hmm. And his hospice service got involved at that point because they have a program they call um, Gift of a Day. Well, they'll, they'll plan something for their patient, something they've always wanted to do, never did, something they love to do and never thought they'd be able to do again. So their gift of a day was helping us make the arrangements to make this happen. So they provided the ambulance service, but I started research, and they started doing research for me on um, chartered medical jets as well. Came to realize those things aren't cheap. <laughs> and you know, it was something we could afford, but I rarely see anything good about Facebook. This is a moment where I'll say something good about Facebook. You know, we could afford it, but I thought, well, you know, what do they say? It's not what you know, it's whom you know. Mm -hmm. So I went to Facebook just thinking maybe a friend or a family member might know someone with a connection to a chartered me medical jet company. And that's what I asked. All I wanted was a connection, thinking it might help mitigate the cost. <coughs> People started commenting, nope, Jim, we don't, but you and John deserve to get married. We want to help make it happen, so please accept this gift of cash. Mm -hmm. And our family and friends covered the entire $14,000 <coughs> cost of the chartered medical jet. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And one of the things in, in your book that I thought really stuck out to me was this um, quote, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but you said, I, you said that you were struck by the absurdity that a bedridden man had to travel 520 miles to Maryland to get married when the Hamilton Ho County Courthouse was just six blocks from your house. Right. And, and to me, that was just absolutely absurd, as, as you said. A absurd it was. <laughs> Yeah, so what did it mean for you, like thinking back on all the things that you went through, you and John went through to get to this point, what did it mean for you when you finally had that, and can you talk about your wedding ceremony and what did it mean to finally be able to call each other husband? Yeah, so we, we flew to Maryland in this cramped jet. It was a nurse, Aunt Paulette, John and I, and the pilots, and we landed at BWI and parked on the tarmac. We never left the airplane. and. I put John, the, John's gurney up so he was sitting up, and I took his hand, and you know, we got to say those words we had wanted to say for 20 years, those words we never thought we would be able to say, I do, I be wed. And to say it's the happiest moment of our lives just sounds kind of cliche, but it was the happiest moment of our lives because we finally got to say, make it legal and public that, yeah, you're the person I, I choose to spend my life with. You're the person 
I can't imagine living my life without. And in some ways, you know, people will say, well, you, you were together for so long. What really changed? You'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. Everything changed. Mm -hmm. And I think in the, the days that followed, the word husband came out of our mouths every sentence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good morning, husband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want something to drink, husband? I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> husband came out of our mouths all the time, but it felt good. Mm -hmm. It felt good to say that and to know that, yeah, we're not just using that word. It actually means something. It stands for something. And our federal government recognizes that word when it comes to our relationship. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was also knowing that, you know, when John dies, I will be his widower. And I don't, I want the right to say that mm -hmm. and to have that mean something. Yeah. And so... You know, most people who are in the bliss of, you know, just getting married don't find themselves filing a lawsuit. <laughs> no. um, or like, so you, hope, <laughs> you hope you don't. Um, but in your case, it, it was necessary. And so can you tell us about, you know, your, your, that process of, of filing the lawsuit and why you guys did? Yes, yeah, so this wasn't something we'd ever thought about. You know, a lot of people think that we applied and went through an audition process to be plaintiffs. That wasn't the case at all. We had never thought about it. And it was really just a series of events that happened to occur. Um, one of our friends was on the Cincinnati, the editorial board of the Cincinnati Enquirer, and she really wanted the paper to come out in support of marriage equality. So when she found out we were getting married, she asked if she could write a story about, about it. And we said, okay. So when we got married, someone joined us, joined us in that airplane. It was the photographer from the paper. He took pictures and video. And we got married on a Thursday, and on Saturday, our story came out online. It was coming out in the Sunday print edition, but it came out online on Saturday. And friends, neighbors of ours, were at a party, and they ran into a friend of theirs who's a civil rights attorney in Cincinnati, and our story came up in conversation. Al, the attorney, I don't think he had even heard our, about us at all, and Barb and Mike told him about us, what we had gone through, and said, you need to go read their story, it's, it's online right now. Well, then they got in touch and Barb and Mike reached out and said, hey, John and Jim, we ran into our friend Al, told your story, he's curious if you might be, able to, might be willing to meet him. Mm -hmm. We really had no idea why. Mm -hmm. But five days after we got married on Tuesday, Al came to our home, we met him for the first time, and he pulled out a blank Ohio death certificate. And that's what did it. Mm -hmm. And I really like to say, you know, People were like, well, you knew Ohio wouldn't recognize your marriage. Yes, but that was an abstract understanding. Mm -hmm. This piece of paper, the death certificate, made it real. It made that abstract state defense of marriage act into something real and harmful and hurtful. And when Al asked if we wanted to do something about it, John and I talked, and John was very clear. He's like, yes, I think we should, but Jim, remember, it's all on you because I can't do anything. He was completely bedridden, but we agreed it was the right thing to do. So 11, eight days after we got married, we filed suit in federal court. And 11 days after we got married, I was in federal district court in Cincinnati for the hearing. So um, who did you sue and why? So <laughs> our legal <laughs> argument, <laughs> um, you know, in Ohio, first cousins cannot get a marriage license to get married. Same thing with an underage couple. They cannot get a marriage license in Ohio. However, in other states where first cousins can get married or underage couples can get a marriage license, if they get married, as soon as they cross the border into Ohio, Ohio immediately said, we see your marriage, it exists, it's valid, we recognize it, we respect it, even though it's a marriage that could not be entered into in Ohio itself. So our legal argument was, Ohio, you're creating separate classes of citizens. You're treating people differently for no valid constitutional reason. So that was our legal argument. And forget the second part of your question. <laughs> so who was the original? Who, who oh, was, that's right. Who was, who was the defendant? So when we filed our suit, we, we sued the governor of Ohio, John Kasich, and the attorney general, Mike DeWine. So it was Obergefell and Arthur versus, I forget how it started initially, if it was Kasich or DeWine or both of them, I honestly can't remember. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And you went through a couple of permutations before you got to the gentleman sitting to your left. Correct. Yes. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> okay. And uh, ultimately, Rick, you end up uh, being uh, appointed director of the Ohio Department of Health, mm -hmm. and that is in that role is when uh, you ended up at the other side of the V. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so yeah. let's switch, switch to Rick. Yeah, so Rick, bit. this is where uh, you come in. So now. <laughs> I was enjoying him a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we want to get to know you a little bit and, uh, and kind of dive into your background. And I know you have some deep roots here in Northwest Ohio. Can you tell us about where you kind of grew up and, um, and your, if you, your connection to the University of Toledo? Sure, I grew up in the Archbold and um, graduated from high school there and got my master's for here at the University of Toledo. And uh, my first job was Fulton County Treasurer and then was elected to the House of Representatives in the 90s and have been active in or around government my whole career. Mm -hmm. So early on, were you, were you politically active? Do you know that that's what you wanted to go into in your life? Yeah, I uh, was very active and had some uh, um, friends who were very good to me. Um, gave me opportunities that a lot of people don't get and uh, that I was just lucky to have. And so uh, came into politics, it was during the Reagan Revolution. Archbold's not exactly a bastion of left-wing extremism, so <laughs> <laughs> I came in on the conservative uh, uh, side of uh, politics in the Republican Party and um, just had uh, kind of grew from there. And can you uh, tell us a little bit about your early political days and, and maybe a party that you went to in the 80s? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. It, it, in all honesty, I'm a bit player in this. Um, he's the hero. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just happy that I have an opportunity to talk about our friendship and the, the good things that can come out of this with, with Jim. But um, um, it, it, it just fascinates me how our stories, everybody's story over the last 30, 40 years when it comes to this issue has evolved so much and people have changed so much. And it's, it's encouraging and it's heartening. I remember some of my first experiences in politics, um, um, going to parties where you know, Ronald Reagan had been a speaker and um, going to parties where Jerry Falwell was there and Phyllis Schlafly and uh, Bill Rush or Bill Buckley, for you, some of you younger people, you may not know much, but they struck fear into the hearts of liberals everywhere um, <laughs> back then. And back then the issues were, you know, defeating communism, personal freedom, limited size of government. Those were the issues that brought us together. But there was the, also the issue of homosexuality in public in general. And some of those people said things like, uh, you know, AIDS is the gay plague. Um, used it as an opportunity to talk about, you know, the damnation of homosexuals, things like that. Uh, no defense for them. They own it. Uh, they have to owe up to it, but that's not everything that they were. And I wonder sometimes, had they been able to live over the last 35 years where they would be today, I suspect in a very, very different place, like many people are mm -hmm. uh, in society. So, but that, that back then, I would have told you, uh, and I would have believed it, that uh, I don't know any gay people. Um, that turned out to be not true at all as the AIDS epidemic became a national issue. Uh, and so many, it was a death sentence at the time, um, horrible death sentences. And so many people, our friends, relatives, brothers, sisters, had to come out of the closet and say, I'm gay, I have AIDS, I'm dying. And to me, that was the, that was the issue surrounding um, people who are homosexuals, not, not, you know, should they get married or should they, you know, be legally recognized or something. It, it was an issue of compassion. Mm -hmm. Seeing my friends who, uh, really one of the biggest regrets I have to this day is a friend I had who came out and told me that he was gay. We'd known each other for 15 years. He was a good friend. And uh, it, it made me really sad because he could never share that part of himself until he knew he was dying. And he would have been safe with me, but that's how afraid he was to share who he, who he was. So to me, the, the, the meaning of Jim's case, I guess our case, I'm the, I'm the asterisk, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like to say I'm on, on the roadkill under Jim's bus. <laughs> <laughs> 
the meaning of what of this case is all those people who we cared about and loved they were vindicated too mm -hmm. Wonderful. and then um how and when did you become the director of the high department of health can you tell us about that august of 2014. okay so right when this is getting kicked up into the upper yes. court of the wall okay and so just to uh recap the litigation a little bit so you sue in federal district court mm -hmm. Um, in uh, the Southern District of Ohio, that's in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. right? And um, so at the district court level, uh, the Honorable Timothy S. Black uh, held in a fairly limited ruling that, uh, I'll quote, under the Constitution of the United States, Ohio must recognize valid out-of-state marriages between same-sex couples on Ohio death certificates, just as Ohio recognizes all other out-of-state marriages, if valid, in the state performed, and even if not authorized, nor validly performed under Ohio law, such as marriages between first cousins, marriages of certain minors, and common law marriages. So that really echoes what you mm -hmm. mentioned was the essential legal theory of your case. Right, and it was a very limited ruling that was, as the case went on, that was sort of the, the conversation, the negotiations between our side and the state was, let's make this fairly limited, um, we were okay with that, at least that I recall. Al might disagree with me or correct me, because Al Gerhardstein, our wonderful, amazing attorney, is here, and he can absolutely correct me if I'm wrong on that. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was it was an agreement we we made because we it made it easier going if we agreed to say, okay, this can be limited to us, to death certificates, and we'll go from there. And then it goes up to the uh, Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and uh, it was consolidated with a number of other mm -hmm. challenges uh, from um, Ohio, Tennessee, Michigan, and Kentucky. And in that uh, case, in that litigation, the Sixth Circuit held that uh, state bans on same-sex marriages did not violate the Constitution of the United States, uh, and that creates a circuit split. Uh, so for those of you who are not uh, lawyers or law students, uh, we often think of the United States Supreme Court as a court that corrects just legal errors, but it's actually, it only takes a relatively small number of cases every year, and mostly it's um, taking cases where the federal courts of appeals have a disagreement. So it's what we call a circuit split. Uh, and so that made it, uh, mm -hmm. when that circuit split occurred, made it likely to go to the United States Supreme Court. Yeah, that was the silver lining to that loss. You know, that was a painful loss, made me angry. And the dissenting opinion in that case is amazing. Judge Martha Daughtry really took the other two judges on that panel to task. Because in essence, they said we didn't belong in a court of law, that we were wasting their time. And she strongly disagreed with that opinion. but. As much as it hurt, it was that silver lining because every other appeals court, every other circuit court up to that point had ruled in favor of marriage equality. So now suddenly we have the split. Maybe this means it's going to go to the Supreme Court. And that's, that was the silver lining. And that's what helped, helped us keep going. And so ultimately, the Supreme Court grants certiorari to hear the case. Uh, what was it like uh, to hear that your case was going up to the Supreme Court? Surreal. <laughs> um, you know. I hope that's what was going to happen. You know, when, when Al said, you know, we, we've done it, we've we filed cert with the Supreme Court, now we have to wait and see what they say. But again, the expectation was they would likely accept it because of the circuit splits. It's a really weird thing to realize there's a case you're involved in going to the Supreme Court. And at that point, I still, none of us knew what it would be called. And it wasn't until um, early in 2015 that, and Al had warned me, he said, well, Jim, just be aware, if the Supreme Court follows their tradition, the way of doing things, this very well might be called Obergefell v. Hodges, because they name consolidated cases based on the lowest case number. And Al filed cert on our case in the consolidated group about 10 or 20 minutes before the Tennessee case did. So we had the lowest case number. That's, that's all it took. That's the magic for why it's Obergefell v. Hodges. And that's a really bizarre thing to hear. But it's also one of those things where I still feel some guilt about it because it's my name and my face and John's and my story that has become 
synonymous with this, but I wasn't the only plaintiff. There were more than 30 other plaintiffs. You know, there was another widow where there were couples, there were parents, there were children. I mean, our youngest plaintiff was two years old. So it wasn't just about me and John. It wasn't just Obergefell. There were so many other plaintiffs with equally compelling and valid and important stories and cases. Did you get to know the other plaintiffs and have you stayed in touch with them at all? I, I do stay in, I got to know the ones in Ohio, not surprisingly, they're the ones I got to know the best. There were several couples in Cincinnati with children and Al had their case as well. That was about birth certificates. So I got to be friends with them. There was a couple from Manhattan who adopted in Ohio. I got to be friends with them and the Tennessee couple. Um, so yeah, I definitely became, met them all and became friends with with a subset of them. So Jim, you've mentioned your attorney, Al. Yes. Al Gerhardstein, and he happens to be in the audience. I'd like to give him a shout out. And Al, would you mind standing up and getting a round of applause? So Jim, what was it like working with Al? Did you like him? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I have to say, I think one of my favorite questions I've gotten, because I've spoken in front of a lot of groups of attorneys and law schools, and I've gotten the question before, you know, what, what's your opinion of the legal profession now? And I think they love it when I say, you know, working with Al and his entire team, but gave me the utmost, utmost respect for the legal profession. Because especially civil rights attorneys, they are out there fighting for our rights and helping make sure our rights aren't being abridged. And Al was an amazing man to work, work with. I think he's brilliant. I think other attorneys think that. He's also just kind. And I really think back to that day John and I met him, and I wonder if it had been a different attorney, someone with a different personality, different way of being. It, our decision could have been completely different. Al's amazing, and, and I love to, and I'll share this story because this to me speaks to Al's character. You know, I think most attorneys would say one of their dreams is to argue in front of the Supreme Court. Makes perfect sense. Well, here we are with a case that's going to the Supreme Court, and Al's no different. He wants to argue at the Supreme Court. Why wouldn't he? And the other plaintiffs in the Ohio case and I, we fully supported that. You know, Al's been fighting for civil rights for more than 40 years. And some of the other attorneys in other states said, well, you know, we think we should have someone who's argued before the Supreme Court previously. We want that experience. Well, a decision was made to have a moot court, a practice court, practice arguments. They brought in an attorney who's argued multiple times in front of the Supreme Court. So he would have a chance to argue the case for the right to recognition. And Al would argue the right to recognition in front of a pretend three-judge panel made up of attorneys. And that happened. They asked the plaintiffs who were there. They asked our opinion. We gave our opinion. We left. And then the legal team got together. And Al pretty much stopped them all and said, Douglas did a better job. He's the one who should defend them at the Supreme Court because it's all about doing what's best for the plaintiffs. Yeah. To me, that, that's how you need to know about Al. Yeah. He gave up his chance willingly to argue at the Supreme Court. So very intimate details of your private life were, were in the public. Mm -hmm. um, tell us how that made you feel. It was a little weird coming out nationally in the news. <laughs> you know, it it's, can be scary enough coming out to your family and your friends and your, in your own small world, but here we were proclaiming to the world, hi, I'm a professional gay. <laughs> <laughs> so it was weird, but... The thing is, you know, our story was a story of love and loss, and mm -hmm. I never felt bad about sharing that. I never felt, felt awkward or weird talking about John and what our relationship meant, what it meant for the state to say we don't exist, to pretend we didn't matter, or mm -hmm. to pretend we don't exist and say we don't matter. I don't know. It, it was oddly easy. But I also have to admit, maybe part of that is, you know, when we filed and it got going, John was still here, and he was nearing the end of his life, and my focus was really on those four walls of his room. 
And I did what I, what I needed to and what I could in courtroom and in the media, but my focus was always on John. And so everything else was kind of, I don't know, I, maybe I just didn't notice it as much as maybe I would have, because all I cared about was John and making sure he was safe and comfortable and doing everything I could to make his, his remaining months, whatever it turned out to be, as good as possible. So I think that helped maybe keep me from realizing just how crazy it was to have our story out there in the news. Mm -hmm. And yeah, never bothered me. Obviously, there was a lot of negative reaction from people, um, and you were already going through this very stressful experience. How did you deal with all the negative, hateful reaction? Okay, so one thing, I never read comments online. Good. Because I knew that was pointless, and it would just make me angry. But I also love this, I get this question a lot as well. You know, I would say, you know, from the moment we filed our suit to the Supreme Court decision, that's just shy of two years. And in those two years, hundreds, thousands of incredibly positive and personal experiences, emails, cards, letters, people stopping me to talk to me and hug me and cry, talk about their loved ones. And in that same time frame, three negative things, mm. just three. Other than some protesters, a level up across the street outside the federal courthouse in our first hearing, and then the protesters at the Supreme Court, which I merrily ignored, that was it. No one ever came up to me one-on-one -on -one to attack me, to attack the fight, to say we were doing the wrong thing. My experience was 99.99% positive. That's great. I feel really lucky in that, because I know other, other people who have been through similar fights certainly haven't had that experience. Thanks. So Rick, let's talk about your role in the case. Uh, you, you've described yourself <laughs> as the accidental defendant. Um, uh, first, what, uh, in what capacity were you a defendant? What, how exactly did this come out? I was uh, sitting in the capacity of uh, director of the Ohio Department of Health and the Department of Health, among many things that the Department of Health does, it is responsible for uh, birth and death certificates, and, and that was the issue that uh, Jim had sued about was, was the death certificate. So, yeah, that was my role. What was your uh, thought initially when you took over an office that was in pretty active, high-profile litigation? Well, the first thing, the first few days I was there, um, our lawyer came to me and said, you know, you're the defendant in the Oberg Obergefell case. And I said, who's Jim Obergefell and what did I ever do to him? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he said, well, it's the same-sex marriage case. And my, my real reaction was, oh, hell no, you call him up and tell him we were kidding. I don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's, uh, uh, it's not that easy. <laughs> but it was, you know, knowing that my 15 minutes of fame will be for this case being on the wrong side. And 20 years from now, I may be a New York Times crossword puzzle answer every once in a while because we've been, <laughs> been there a few times. I was very, very uncomfortable with it um, simply because I, ha I, ha I took an oath to defend the Constitution and laws of the state of Ohio and the United States of America. I took that oath very seriously. But on the same token, I'm okay with, with what Jim's trying to do here, you know? Um, it was, I, I'm okay with the whole concept of people who love each other getting married. And um, so it, was very, it, was, it wasn't nearly as difficult for me as it was for many, many other people, and I recognize it, but it, it made me very uncomfortable. And I thought about quitting, um, that uh, I was just doing my job, but some horrible crimes have been committed by people who said they were just doing their jobs. Uh, but I also thought about my confidence that I have in the government process. Um, it's slow, it's awkward. Uh, we, it doesn't move nearly as quickly as we would like to, but eventually we get to the right place. And so I began to see how can I reconcile my, my duty to defend uh, that I t when I took my oath with my personal feelings about the case. And I thought, you know, a role I can play is to make this process as dignified as possible. Uh, first and foremost, this is about a man who lost his husband. 
we're not going to turn that into a circus. Um, second, we have the Department of Health. I mean, we're supposed to protect you from disease and inspect hospitals and nursing homes and um, things like that. It's also the department that oversees abortion and sex education and, and a lot of these issues, birth and death certificates, an uh, amazing amount of controversy. A lot of these issues are really surprisingly controversial and will suck the oxygen out of the room and away from everything else you're trying to accomplish. So I tried to avoid a lot of those issues, not because I didn't care, but because we had a lot of things we had to get done. So keeping in mind the, the gravity of, of why Jim filed the suit in the first place, the fact that we had to get work done and we couldn't be distracted, the fact that we do a lot of work, we have a very large and active um, LGBTQA um, uh, employee group, that I didn't want those people coming to work thinking that their employer was out to get them. Uh, I really focused on how do I, how do I uh, honor my duty to defend with the people uh, at the same time who are engaged in this. So a lot of what I started doing was really centered around reaching out to make, making sure we handle this with dignity. Were you actively involved in the litigation itself or strategy or anything like that? No, uh, not at all. Um, they, the lawyers explained it to me and they asked me if I wanted to go and but not really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, you know, I'll stay here in Columbus. Yeah. But that was about it. <laughs> you really were just a name. I was a name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you uh, discuss the, the case or the issues with uh, Governor Kasich or other people in the administration? No, that, um, that, that's really not the way at least the Kasich administration worked. We were never given instructions on how to handle things. Um, we did, you know, somebody in my administration, well, I don't think it was me, but uh, maybe our lawyer did say, you know, we're probably going to lose this case. And uh, I, frankly, I've never been so happy to lose in my life. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're, we're probably going to lose this case. Why don't we prepare to lose so that all of the, the process and the mechanics are in place? And I said, that, you know, that's a good idea. Uh, I don't want these people to wait. I mean, Jim probably would have given us 30, 60, 90 days to comply with the court ruling, but I didn't want people to wait five minutes um, once the decision was announced. So we spent most of our time reaching out to our employees and, and working out the process for how to implement this. Um, so let's move ahead to the, the date that the Supreme Court announced its decision in Obergefell v. Hodges. Jim, um, where were you when the decision was announced in June of 2015? I was in the courtroom. And what did you do? How did you feel? Oh, I felt okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, well, I like starting when I got there that morning because, you know, the, well, the Supreme Court, they will say they release decisions on Mondays. That's what they schedule. But they don't tell you what decision's coming out on any particular day. So everyone said, Jim, this is a big case. They hold those till the end. Start coming back to D.C. in June if you want to be in, in the courtroom. So I started going back. I was there June 15th in the courtroom for decisions, no decision. I was there June 22nd, no decision. We left the courthouse and we were on the plaza when someone came running out and said, now mind you, at this point we thought it was going to be, well, Monday, June 29th. Someone came running out and said, well, they just added Thursday, June 25th as a decision day. A moment later, someone else came running out and said, well, they just added Friday, June 26th as a decision day. And at that point, we looked at each other and said, it's going to be on Friday because June 26th is an important date for the LGBTQI community with the Supreme Court. 2004, Lawrence versus Texas struck down sodomy laws, and United States versus Windsor came out on June 26th in 2013. So we thought, well, this is it. So I get to the, to the courthouse that morning on Friday, June 26th, and got in line on the sidewalk to be in the, pub, in the public seats in the courthouse, courtroom, and... At one point, the police officer comes by and hands out the 50 to 70 tickets for the public seats, like they did every other time I was there for oral arguments for every other decision day. And we're all chatting, and I look down at the ticket, and I notice, well, something is different. Every other day I'd been there, the ticket was bright orange. On Friday, June 26th, it wasn't bright orange. It was lavender. Oh. Oh. We thought, well, this has to be a sign. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we were already optimistic, but boy, did that make us even more optimistic. So we get into the courtroom, sit down, and the hearing come, the session comes to order. And just, the Chief Justice says, Justice Kennedy will read the first decision. And they read our case number, which I'd only finally memorized the, the day before. And I'm sitting between friends, and I grabbed their hands, and I, I think I squeaked and like sat up in my chair. <laughs> and Justice Kennedy started reading his decision, and my immediate reaction was, we won. And he kept reading this legal language, and I found myself thinking, did we? <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> and then as he kept reading, it, it, it hit me, yeah, we did win. And you know, my first thought was, John, I wish you were here. I wish you could experience this and know that our marriage really does matter, and our marriage exists. I burst into tears, and I remember Al telling me afterwards, he said, Jim, I've never seen so many attorneys crying in a courtroom. And one of the things I realized within moments of thinking about John is, wow, for the first time in my life as an out gay man, I feel like an equal American. So we listened to the, the decision, then they read the, the dissents, and I merrily ignored those. I thought, I don't care, <laughs> we won. <laughs> we had to sit through a couple more decisions, and I'm just champing at the bit, because I know there's a party happening out, out in front of the courthouse, and I just want to be out there, because I, I had images of Edie Windsor and others coming down those steps into the crowd, and that's what I wanted to do. And, the hearing comes to an end, we gather in the hallway, and we eventually make our way out onto the plaza. We weren't able to go down the front steps like, typical, like usual because the crowd had pushed past the barricades. So for safety's sake, we exited the side. And Al and I are arm in arm with some other plaintiffs and attorneys behind us, and we step up into the crowd, and they see us, and they just part before us. The air was electric. I mean, I can't think of any better way to describe it, but the air was electric, and people were crying, people were cheering, people were singing, and we just made our way through that crowd as, I mean, this feeling of utter joy. And yeah, we went and spoke to the press, I had an interview, and then I got a phone call mm -hmm. from the president. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and the vice president called while I was talking to the president and went to voicemail. <laughs> <laughs> he did call back. <laughs> so yeah, it, that day was amazing. I mean, just that feeling of, yeah, the court actually lived up to those words inscribed in the pediment, equal justice under law. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was just knowing that I no longer have to fear like I did Going to the mailbox after we lost at the Sixth Circuit, I kid you not, when I went to the mailbox, I wondered, is today the day I pull out a piece of an envelope from the state of Ohio with an updated death certificate with our marriage erased? I thought, I never have to worry about that again. So, um, Rick, your story on uh, the, the day of is probably a little less exciting. But <laughs> it was dramatic. <laughs> Still, where, where were you when you heard, and what was your reaction? I was um, in my office in a meeting, and our lawyer came in and said uh, the, the case was decided. And I said, what was the outcome? And he said, you lost. And I, and I said, no, bud, you're the lawyer. You lost. <laughs> 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 yeah. What was the vote? And he said five to four. And I said, how did we ever get four votes? <laughs> um, it really surprised me that we got four votes. But no, it was like, OK. Um, you know, we'd already cleared all of our changes through the governor's office. I said, you know, start the process. Let's get this done by the end of the afternoon. We'll send out the faxes and the emails now. Let's make sure everybody's on board by the end of the afternoon. And uh, we'll move on. Um, and I did have a, a friend who's been a friend since we were kids um, who uh, wanted to be the, the first same-sex marriage in Ohio. As a matter of fact, he would call me and say, uh, Rick, do you know when you're going to lose yet? And, <laughs> and, and I said, well, Steve, it's, I don't think it's the way it works. I don't think the Chief Justice is going to call me up and say, no, 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 this is a bad day for you. you know, you know, like that. <laughs> and he says, why? I, and I said, I can't fix it for you. And he said, well, if, when that day comes, would you please read the Bible at my wedding? And I said, sure. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. So a few days after, 
Uh, the decision came down. Uh, he had his wedding. It was uh, up in the loft at Lindy's, a restaurant down in Columbus. And every Republican who you know, who you hear about was up at that wedding. Governor Kasich was there, every, you know, all the statewide office holders. And I'm thinking, you know, we've kind of slowed this down for the last 30 years, but you know, what, how could this have gone faster if, if we would have been different? And, uh, but I thought, you know, these people are all here because they love their friend and they want to celebrate his wedding with him. And isn't it really cool what people can, what people can do? the way they can change and embrace other people. And I'm sure if you ask, well, I'm not sure, but last time I heard Governor Kasich comment, um, you know, he said that he believes that marriage is between a man and a woman. Uh, that's his opinion. Um, but there was a whole lot of caring and compassion that day and celebration for these friends of ours. Great. Awesome. So we're going to kind of talk now about some kind of hindsight and looking back and, and kind of, you know, five years later, what do you guys think? Um, so one of the, I think one of the more beautiful things that came out of this case was Justice Kennedy's um, op op majority opinion. And I want to read a quote from it and get your thoughts on it, uh, Jim. So he said in the majority, he said, in forming a marital union, two people become something greater than they once were. As some of the petitioners in these cases demonstrate, marriage embodies a love that may endure even past death. It would misunderstand these men and women to say they disrespect the idea of marriage. Their plea is that they do respect it, respect it so deeply that they seek to find its fulfillment for themselves. Their hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions. They ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law, and the Constitution grants them that right. So what does that mean to you? Thinking back on everything that has happened leading up to that point, what do those words mean to you to hear a justice of the United States Supreme Court say that? Oh, I mean, I love it for a whole range of reasons. You know, the fact that he referenced John in that and our relationship enduring even past death. I loved that. I love that he made that comment. And I also did what Aunt Tootie did. I went to the internet and clicked the ordain me button. <laughs> And I've officiated, I think, 18 weddings now, and I say I include that in every single ceremony. Mm -hmm. And I've heard from a lot of people whose weddings I haven't attended or officiated that it's in, I think it's become a law that every same-sex couple has to read that <laughs> in their wedding. <laughs> but it's also opposite-sex couples mm -hmm. because it's such a beautiful piece of writing. Mm -hmm. And I think it just speaks to, it really captures what it is we were fighting for respect and the right to call the most important person in our world, in our life, our husband or our wife. I mean, it's just a beautiful piece of writing and yeah, it's, it's important to me because I do. I, I get to share that in a lot of weddings. Mm -hmm. And as a future lawyer, we're taught in law school all the time that words matter and words have value and meaning. And in the moments, at, as you said, on the plaza after your decision came out, um, you said in an interview that um, your hope was that one day gay marriage would not be called gay marriage. It would just be called marriage. Yep. Um, do you think five years later that we're getting closer to that um, or, or do we still have more work to do? Oh, I think we're getting closer to it. You know, in the five years, almost five years since the decision, the sky hasn't fallen. Mm -hmm. The world's still revolving and rotating. Mm -hmm. It's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think more and more people are realizing that. People who were against marriage equality are realizing that. And I think they're also, those people who were opponents, they're getting to know people in their world, whether it's family or coworkers or friends, who are getting married as same-sex couples. So, yes, I think gay marriage, I think those two words together being used much less frequently. Mm -hmm. And I, I will compare it to interracial marriage. When's the last time you heard anyone say, oh, well, they got interracially married? Mm -hmm. yeah. It doesn't happen. Yeah. They got married. <laughs> it's a marriage. Same thing with same-sex marriage. It's simply a marriage. Mm -hmm. So we'll get there. It might take some time, and there's certainly been backlash. Mm -hmm. But I think more has changed than has gone back the other way. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, interracial marriage or prohibitions on interracial marriage were struck down in a case called Loving versus Virginia, mm -hmm. one of the most wonderfully named Supreme Court cases. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so in uh, building on Beth's question, uh, in 40 years, do you think uh, your case is going to be remembered like Loving or uh, more like Roe versus Wade, which is still a very controversial case? I think in general more like loving because I think it already is so many people make that comparison you know even when you get down to the arguments used by the states against interracial marriage and same-sex marriage they recycled a lot of the same arguments from interracial marriage against interracial marriage against same-sex marriage so I think just by virtue of what the cases are fighting for yes I think people think of Obergefell v Hodges more in along the lines of loving versus Virginia. It was also marriage. And the fact that it is loving, I think that that's amazing. And I will say one of the things, I would have been perfectly A-OK -okay if my name hadn't become the name of the case. Because the last name of one of the Tennessee plaintiffs is Love. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, how amazing would that be if loving versus Virginia, and then I can't remember what the name of his case was, but if the same-sex marriage case had the word love in it as well. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some similarities with Roe v. Wade just in the controversy. And because so much of the controversy in those two cases or the, the, the people who, are, who oppose those cases is fundamentally religiously based. So I think that brings those together as well. But for me, I think Obergefell v. Hodges I think most people immediately tie it with loving. It's hard not to. Okay. Uh, so speaking of those who uh, oppose uh, same-sex marriage, Justice Kennedy, uh, in his opinion, wrote that Americans who argue for traditional marriage are, quote, decent and honorable. You want to react to that? Yeah, so I have a couple thoughts. You know, the whole traditional marriage, you know, Ricky even mentioned it, John Kasich, says he still believes in traditional marriage, marriage between a man and a woman. And I'll go back to something Ruth Bader Ginsburg said during oral arguments, because that argument against same-sex marriage came up. You're trying to redefine what marriage means. You're trying to change something that's meant the same thing for millennia. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg jumped right up and, and, and said, no, I'm sorry, we already have redefined marriage because women are no longer the property of their husbands. So, if you're going to argue for traditional marriage, what exactly are you arguing for? Are you arguing for the man to own the wife? The wife to not be able to get a credit card in her name if they get divorced? Are you arguing, arguing for dowries? What exactly is this traditional marriage that you're arguing for? Because marriage has changed. Because society has changed. So I think that's... I don't buy that argument whatsoever. You know, our society grows, our society changes. We learn more about human beings. We learn more about everything in this world. And by virtue of that, things are going to change. So I think there are a lot of misguided people who are still against marriage equality. And I think they're misguided because they have this belief that Marriage is owned by a church. Marriage is owned by a religion. Marriage is defined solely by their religion or their interpretation of a religion. They forget that in the United States, there's one thing you need to get married, and that's a marriage license issued by the state. That's not a religious ceremony. That's not a blessing by a religious leader. It's a license issued by the state. So for me, so much of the opposition is based in this rooted in religion and you know, traditional marriage. That's fine. If you want to own holy matrimony in your church, you own it. Just like before marriage equality, a, a Catholic priest could not be forced to marry a Catholic and a Jew. That hasn't changed. So there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of misguided people, and I think it's churches and opponents who like to say, well, this is the way it is, and you're wrong, because marriage is only between a man and a woman. And 
holy matrimony is only between one man and one woman. That's fine. That's your church. I'm not going to your church to get my marriage license. I'm going to a government office. So, Jim, one of the criticisms of this case from some people on the left is that the case glorifies marriage in a way that denigrates non-marital relationships and families. Do you have a response or a reaction to that? I honestly don't quite understand that because we have marriage equality, but there's no one going out there with a gun and saying, you, you have to get married. You, you have to get married. You have the option to get married. You have the right to get married. And I guess I can see in some ways because, you know, a lot of the opposition was all around, you know, it harms the family and marriage, 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 and it's a man and a woman and it's family and it's family. And people who are in relationships and have children without marriage, they're already getting a lot of negative negativity from that part of, the, of our population. They're already getting it. So I don't, personally, I don't think our, our case the fight for marriage equality in any way, shape, or form denigrated people who choose not to get married because we were simply fighting to have the right to decide to get married and to exercise that right. So I hate that people might feel that way because it certainly wasn't anything I ever thought and it wasn't, wasn't something we did purposefully in this case. We simply want the right. We want the option. If we find the person we love and we agree that marriage is for us, then we want that right. We want the ability, but we're not forcing it on anyone else. So, Rick, a couple questions uh, about your role as a government official. I, I find it really interesting uh, being in the position of, of being a government official and being in the position of defending a law that you disagree with. I think it's a really difficult uh, position. And as you mentioned, you took an oath to uphold the law. Um, do you have any more thoughts on being in that position and uh, of being uh, the government official where the law says one thing, but your personal beliefs are in a different place? It happens. I, mean, I think everybody who takes that oath has more than a few occasions where they say, I really don't believe what I, in what I'm doing. Um, and there are a lot of times when um, you, you, take a, you, you look at the law and you say, I have to implement this law, but I also have to save the legislature from itself. Um, <laughs> that I've got to find a structure for implementing this law so it's fair and reasonable to everybody to protect the law itself. Um, from court challenges, so I can't do what you know the advocates of the law want, want me to do here. I have to protect the integrity of the law. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah. Uh, and, and make it something that's not arbitrary and capricious, but something that actually works. So I think that's, for me, that's the comfort zone, uh, knowing that, that I have a chance to, to shape this mechanism so it's fair to all concerned and still reflects the general attitude of the legislature. One thing we, we've chatted about uh, before is it's just an interesting context about whether uh, government officials feel obligated to follow a particular law or sp particular Supreme Court case. And so there's an interesting potential contrast between the way government officials uh, were rigorously enforcing uh, prohibitions on uh, same-sex uh, same marriage versus the way they're rigorously enforcing the Supreme Court's precedent in Roe versus Wade. You have any thoughts on that? I mean, that's, that's a good example. In, in Ohio, um, there, there's been a lot of pro-life, if you will, legislation. And, and the Right to Life movement will say that their strategy, and this is not a secret, I mean, they say it in public, their strategy is death by a thousand cuts, that they want to get Roe v. Wade overturned by all these laws that are being passed that supposedly the court's going to uphold. Um, we have some very strong regulatory rules as a, uh, regarding abortion in Ohio. My role in that, and, and, and quite frankly, when I was in the legislature, I was strongly pro-life, I still am, but that was not my job. The Department of Health was not the place to implement my personal value system. I could do that when I was in the legislature, but in the executive branch, I had to thoughtfully implement the law. So 
the way I try to, to resolve a lot of those conflicts between personal opinion and, and the law is to create a structure, a legal system, so that it's fair, it's transparent, it's not biased in any way, shape, or form, and then, then let everybody try to achieve that standard. Um, we, we granted quite a few variances for abortion clinics in Ohio because those clinics could achieve those standards. And that was my job. So do you have, uh, in, in hindsight, looking at all your experience in litigating this case, have any thoughts or advice uh, for um, people who are in this similar position to you as uh, being the public official in a fairly difficult uh, position? And also whether you, there's anything that, uh, in hindsight, you might have done differently? I'd never heard the story that if Jim would have been 20 minutes later, it would have been his case. I would have bought him a cup of coffee while I was walking to the courthouse. <laughs> no, um, there was nothing I would do different. Um, I feel pretty good about the way, the way we manage that. I've made some good friends uh, since then and have the opportunity uh, um, to do this with Jim sometimes, and, and it's been a really good experience. I think for all of us, though, we need to realize that uh, our process works. We certainly have an obligation to participate in that process and even be passionate about our positions in that process. But let's not demonize each other. Let's recognize that, that we're all trying to do the right thing as, and that we're all changing and growing and evolving. And that as long, I think the genius of America is not our morality necessarily, but that we've designed a system where everybody can participate and we don't go out and kill each other in the streets. Uh, I think that's the genius of America, participate compete in the debate, and recognize that in the end the right thing will be done and um, the person on the other side of the argument it can be your friend. Yeah, and to kind of going off of that, we started this conversation um, with a brief discussion of how you guys are a very unlikely friendship. Usually people that sue each other don't end up being friends. Um, and so, you know, our country is really divided on a lot of issues right now. Um, and what advice can you guys, this is a question for both of you, what advice can you guys give um, on, on how to work together and meet people where they are and, 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 and find that civility that we desperately need um, in our country right now? Well, I think for me, I, I have to admit, I, it was easy for me with Rick because when we met and he said, you know, I've never been happier to lose something. I mean, it's hard. Rick, to me, always was a name. I felt like Rick was a fall guy because, you know, we hadn't sued Rick. We'd sued the governor and the attorney general, and Rick's name ended up being there. And I always really did think Rick's just a name. He's kind of a fall guy. So I never went into it with this negative opinion or antipathy towards Rick because he was just a name. And then when we had the chance to meet, and one of the first things he said, again, like I said, was I've never been happier to lose something. It's awfully easy for me to be his friend. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also understanding that he was part of the government that was in charge of enforcing the state's laws, and he had a job to do which was, was impacting John and me. Um, but it was just conversation. I mean, it was, it was a, actually sitting down one-on-one -on -one with another person instead of sitting down, one -on, sitting down with someone who is this caricature or an abstract image, an abstract idea of, of somebody, your opponent. It was a person. Mm -hmm. And he's just an easy guy to be around. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really is. And that, that also helps. So, you know, I, I think it's all too easy for us to forget that we are, we are all human mm -hmm. and that even in those contentious situations, those arguments, that there's humanity on the other side. We just have to be open and willing to see it and to acknowledge it and build from there. I think that's, that's the tough thing. But it's also, I think, you know, I can't demonize Rick. I, can't demonize someone who's against this. But the other side also needs to, to, to think that they have to realize that we aren't these horrible, evil people who are destroying the world, destroying the family. We are human beings, and we're all a 
a whole lot more alike than we are different. And fortunately, that, that truth is forgotten, along with, you know, that golden rule, treat others the way in which you wish to be treated. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Jim's a really likable guy, and um, obviously a man of character, so I'm proud to call him my friend. Uh, and, and I would reiterate, regardless of what side people are on the issues, um, remember that um, we're, we're all human beings and we all have a right to participate in the process and, and eventually we'll come to agreement and we'll do the right thing, but the important thing is that we preserve our respect for each other. Okay. Well, and I'll, I'll just add, you know, Rick has used this term a couple times tonight, evolve. And I will always bring it back to, you know, when, when I came out, when anyone comes out to their family, they're petrified. They're worried. Are they going to love me? Are they going to despise me? Are they going to kick me out? Are they going to hug me and say nothing has changed? And I was fortunate with my family, no issues. But the people who have loved ones who don't react in a positive way, well, that's today. And that person who came out, their hope is over time, that person who has reacted negatively, over time, what they want is for that family member, that friend, that loved one to evolve and to understand, come to understand that they're really no different. We have to give others that same ability to evolve. If they're not where we, hope, where we would like them to be today, they might be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And we have to give them that chance. Okay. All right, so I'd like to invite Professor Salem up to uh, to give some uh, remarks on the current state of some of these legal issues, but I also want to invite those of you in the audience, if you have a note card uh, with a question on it, <coughs> could you please pass it down to the ends of the rows and uh, some of our great Law Review staff folks are going to pick them up. Thank you. So thank you. It's truly uh, an honor for me to be on the same stage with these two men. Uh, I want to thank you again for your activism, your courage, um, the luck of being named as parties in a Supreme Court case and, and um, for sharing your stories. So my job is to take a few minutes just to lower your mood a little bit um, because this was very uplifting. But there's a lot of work to do. And so um, just bear with me for a few minutes, specifically nine minutes and 48 seconds. Um, so marriage equality was undeniably one of the most, if not the most, significant victories for the LGBTQ movement. It's contributed to not just policy change, but it's changed hearts and minds. Today, about two-thirds of the American public supports marriage equality for LGBTQ people. And that's a major cultural shift from just two decades ago when only about a third of Americans supported marriage equality. And that's a testament to the hard work of activists throughout the movement who were smart, strategic, and intentional about their work. They knew that once America got to know their gay, bi, or transgender family, friends, neighbors, and coworkers, that people will see, as Jim said, that we're much more alike than we are different. So this movement is very much a movement defined by contradictions. Consider this. Today, one of the major contenders for the Democratic nomination for president is an openly gay married man. Yet, roughly a third of the American public continues to oppose same-sex marriage. Also, the movement is seen as one of the most successful and effective civil rights movements in our history. Yet, LGBTQ people are still excluded from non-discrimination protections on the federal level and in the majority of states. More and more young people are coming out as gay or transgender, and more schools and families are supportive and affirming, yet queer youth are still taking their own lives at much greater rates than their straight peers. And an estimated 40% of homeless youth are LGBTQ. The privileges that are enjoyed by many white, cisgender, that means traditionally masculine, gay males, are only a dream for many trans women of color who are at such high risk of violence. So as it goes in the civil rights world, the work is never done. Like the feminist movement, the struggle for racial justice, or the fight for economic justice, the LGBTQ struggle for civil rights is not over. We have a lot of work to do, and in some ways, 
marriage equality only underscored the urgency for stronger action. The backlash that we've experienced since 2015 revealed just how much further we have to go. In the year after Obergefell versus Hodges was decided, there were more than 200 anti-LGBTQ bills introduced at the state level throughout the country. And it hasn't really subsided too much since then. Justice for all in our community is still elusive, especially for people of color, women, transgender people, immigrants, our youth, and our seniors. It's vitally important that we focus the movement to address the most vulnerable in our community. So the question is now that there's marriage equality, and we've had the opportunity to see how it's impacted our law and our culture. Where should the movement, the LGBTQ civil rights movement, turn its attention? And I believe there are two issues that deserve our full attention. First, discrimination. And the notion, this notion that discrimination is okay if it's because of religious convictions. And the second is violence against our community. There are also two very distinct subgroups of LGBTQ people that urgently need their rights protected, their safety ensured, and their dignity respected. And those are transgender people and queer youth. And it's no coincidence that the two issues I, dis I addressed, discrimination and violence, and those two subgroups that I talked about, trans people and queer youth, intersect a great deal. Let's start with discrimination. Remember that sexual orientation and gender identity continue to be excluded from federal civil rights laws and the civil rights laws of 29 states, Ohio being one of them. So in Ohio, it's still possible to get married to your same-sex partner, post a marriage announcement on social media, and be fired the very next day from your job because they found out you're gay. These aren't just theoretical scenarios. I've handled cases like this. I've talked to many other people who have experienced similar things because of the lack of civil rights protection in Ohio and other states. And it's not just the lack of legislative protection that's the problem. Many people don't realize that there's a flurry of anti-LGBTQ activity going on in state houses across the country and on the federal level in order to enact brand new discriminatory laws. This current presidential administration has rolled back a number of civil rights protections for LGBTQ people, including a reversal of federal policy that protected transgender workers from discrimination under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act and the reinstitution of the ban on transgender troops serving openly in the military. There have been 54 state bills proposed over the past few years to ban trans people from using restrooms and public accommodations that match their gender identity. Currently, 13 states have pending bills to exclude trans youth from participating in athletics at their schools. A few state bills proposed right now would allow doctors and other healthcare workers to refuse to treat LGBTQ people if doing so violates their religious beliefs. Eight states that are, are attempting to prohibit doctors from providing trans-related healthcare for youth, Ohio being one of them, with a proposed bill just announced this week. There are many other legislative efforts to discriminate that I don't have time to get into tonight, but one of the most disturbing for me is in Tennessee, a law recently signed just earlier this year by the governor of Tennessee that allows adoption agencies and foster care facilities to deny services to people who want to adopt or care for children if the applicants happen to be LGBTQ. So while LGBTQ people in Tennessee can get married and have kids, the state nonetheless adheres to stereotypes and myths about gay and trans parents that have been debunked over and over again. Now much of the effort to dismantle rights or enshrine discrimination is being done under the guise of religious freedom. The movement is increasingly confronting arguments from opponents that the free exercise of religion supersedes the civil rights of LGBTQ people. It's similar to the strategy used by opponents of reproductive rights to chip away at Roe versus Wade. And this is what I see as one of our biggest challenges moving forward. According to the Public Research Research Institute, which is a premier surveying institution uh, around religious attitudes in the country, 30% of Americans today believe that it's permissible for a small business to refuse, refuse services 
to LGBTQ people if doing so violates their religious belief, 30%. That's nearly twice the percentage that thought the same thing only a few years ago in 2014, when only 16% of Americans reported support to ref for refusal of services based on religious beliefs. And it's not just about wedding cakes and photographers or bathrooms and lockers. The rhetoric around religious exemptions for businesses and the scare tactics that are used in the debate about bathrooms seems to have an impact, have had an impact on opinions regarding other minorities as well. Americans are increasingly in favor of allowing businesses to refuse services based on religious beliefs. Today, about 20% of Americans think it's perfectly okay to deny services to Muslims and Jews if it violates the business owner's religious beliefs. 15% of Americans think it's okay to deny services to African Americans for those same reasons. These figures reflect significantly increased support for religious exemptions in just over a few year period. Now it should go without saying that religious freedom is revered in American life, we all believe that, and it deserves the utmost protection. However, the push for exemptions to discriminate presents real and tangible threats to the civil rights of minorities, especially the LGBTQ community. So discrimination is still a real and pervasive problem for the LGBTQ community. The other area of major concern that I mentioned is violence. The most recent FBI data on reported hate crimes shows that while reported hate crimes overall have dipped slightly in 2018, hate crimes against LGBTQ people rose 6% and it rose a whopping 34% for hate crimes against the trans community. 24 trans women were murdered in confirmed or suspected hate crimes in 2019, all of them women of color. And please keep in mind that hate crimes are notoriously underreported, especially for stigmatized communities like, like trans, the transgender community. Ohio, like many other states, intentionally excludes LGBTQ people from its hate crime laws. So if you're a believer that laws serve as a deterrent, like I hope we all do, think about the message that sends to our community. That if someone's race, religion, sex, disability, or nationality is a motivating factor for a crime committed, penalties for the perpetrator will be enhanced. But if the crime was motivated by an animus toward LGBTQ people, oh well. That's apparently okay. It's a dangerous message that has a real impact in society. So it's not surprising that sexual minorities are targets of hatred and violence. And sometimes, unfortunately, that violence is directed inward. A recent study that was reported in the Journal of Adolescent Health confirmed what youth advocates already know. About one in four preteen suicides are queer youth. Queer youth also suffer from substance abuse, depression, homelessness, and bullying at far higher rates than their straight peers. When the state conveys a clear disregard for their well-being, it definitely does not do much to improve those statistics. When the federal government reverses a policy that prohibits anti-transgender discrimination in federally funded schools under Title IX, it's no wonder that it becomes open season on trans kids in public schools. So the post-marriage environment for LGBTQ people in this country is complicated. It's a better environment for some, and for some it's much of the same, and for others, like trans women of color, it's worse. We're seeing strategic efforts to not only dismantle some of the rights and privileges associated with marriage, but also the affirmative efforts to deny basic human rights and dignity to many in our community. So the struggle for equality and justice continues, and the priorities I believe, are eliminating discrimination and violence. Nevertheless, the role that these two gentlemen have played in advancing human rights and improving the lives of millions of people cannot be overstated. I personally will forever be grateful for what you've done. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, okay. Um, and uh, I think most of these are uh, aimed at Jim and Rick, but actually this last one, uh, Rob, you may be interested in. 
Um, I told you no I, questions. He, he did tell yeah. me no <laughs> questions, but I think this is, uh, so do you believe that any landmark cases will come out soon regarding transgender civil rights? Is that, Jim, do you want to go ahead and answer that? I don't want to. Well, I think, you know, the, the cases that the Supreme Court heard in October, which were around discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community in employment, absolutely have, have an impact because one of those cases is in Michigan, a f woman who worked for a funeral home. Most of, most of her life, she presented as a man, even though she knew she was transgender. And after years of considering suicide and just being incredibly unhappy, she made the decision to come out as transgender and present as a woman at work. And she wrote a letter to her boss and her coworkers explaining this. And two weeks later, she was fired for being transgender. And that's one of the employment discrimination cases that were heard by the Supreme Court in October. Another one was a, um, a social worker in Georgia joined a gay softball league and was summarily fired. Another one was a skydiving instructor in New York State. A customer complained to his boss that he was gay. He was fired. So I think th this, those cases have the opportunity to be one of the landmark cases. Is it specifically to transgender? No, but it absolutely impacts the transgender community. So I think that's, that's the one we ha we're looking, worrying about, nervous about currently. I don't know what else there might be, but and feel free to add anything more. No, I, that, that was perfect. And I think that uh, there, the interest, I think, is heightened because the Trump administration is actively opposing or on the other side of uh, the transgender rights advocates. Um, so it should be interesting to see what happens, but um, we're hopeful. We're hopeful that there'll be some good decisions. The Supreme Court right now is, um, as everybody knows, um, you know, it's not certain what, um, how they'll come down, but there's always hope. Well, and I think these cases are also interesting because their argument is this is sex discrimination. They're saying these firings were unlawful because of existing protection f based on sex because they're saying these people were fired because they did not conform to stereotypical behavior, look, whatever, for a man, for a woman. So I, I find that also interesting because it's, it's a different way of approaching this and, and, of, and of fighting for non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people. Right. And also this administration is trying to undermine that legal argument that transgender people are covered under traditional notions of sex discrimination um, by, by affirmatively saying that no, transgender people, um, the, the, the Congress had no intention to include transgender people in their prohibition of sex discrimination under Title VII, so, and Title IX. So it's interesting, you've uh, previewed a couple of the quest other audience questions. So the next one is, what concerns do you have about LGBTQA plus equality under this current administration? I would say... Um, How much time do you have? Yeah, I, <laughs> maybe, maybe a, a fairly brief, uh, because we could be here for a while, I suppose. Please. I will simply say my biggest fear is that this current administration will have the opportunity to nominate and confirm more justices to the Supreme Court. To me, that is by far the scariest thing because that's a change that lasts for decades. And for me, everything falls, on, falls to that because we go to the courts to protect our rights. And if we have a Supreme Court that is firmly against us because it's been filled with opponents of LGBTQ plus equality, I'm not feeling very confident. I'm not feeling very happy about the future. So that's it. There's so much else this administration has done, but that's, that's the part that really scares me because that harms not just me currently, my community currently, but our children, their children. That's, that goes for decades. And I would, I agree, and I think that 
uh, the executive orders and many of the directives that the administration has um, proposed or, or enacted, those can be undone easily mm -hmm. by the next administration. Those are administrative executive actions. Uh, but it's the appointment of judges that they, that's going to last a long time, that effect. Not just Supreme Court, but all those federal all judges. Across, yep. yeah. mm -hmm. Speaking of judges mm -hmm. uh, and the court, are you concerned about the future of marriage equality, given the makeup of the United States Supreme Court and its previous 5-4 split? So the way I look at this currently, if and this is predicated on the assumption that the current nine justices don't change. I'm not too nervous right now because let's say in a perfect world for the opponents, a case made it to the Supreme Court. Even though Chief Justice Roberts was not on our side when our case was decided, if a case came before him that would undo marriage equality, even though he wasn't on our side in 2015, I believe he's a stronger proponent, stronger believer in precedent and also not taking away rights that have previously been granted by the court. So if it came before the court currently, as it currently looks, that's what gives me a little bit of comfort, a little bit of hope, because I think he would say, no, we are not taking away that right that we've previously granted. If it changes more than that, all bets are off. The last question from the audience, what is the next step in the fight for LGBTQ equality? Get out and vote. Get out and vote. Get out and vote. <laughs> and participate in, and I'm kind of giving this out to you, you know, get out and participate in the democratic process. You know, currently in Ohio, the Ohio Fairness Act has had a couple hearings, and that would add gender identity and sexual orientation to the non-discrimination -discrim laws at the state level. Get out, find out when those hearings are, go and voice your support. Get involved because we need allies to speak up on our behalf. We, as the LGBTQ community, we need to speak up on behalf of all other minorities because I mentioned this earlier, you know, the arguments used against the African American community for marriage were used against us. And it isn't just my civil rights, it's everyone's civil rights. We have to be out there fighting for and speaking up on behalf of everyone's civil rights. Because we need to take everyone with us as, as we live up to we the people. Um, but it's the non discrimination, I'll go exactly with what you said, the non discrimination, um, continue, we need to continue banning conversion therapy. Um, and we have got to do something to help our transgender siblings. I mean, the fact that pre predominantly transgender women of color, they can't live their lives without fearing for their lives. And that should make any decent person sick to their stomach. It does me. So let me uh, end with three thank yous, please. Uh, could you join me in thanking the... Uh, Law Review staff and the College of Law staff who helped put this together. Uh, secondly, could you please uh, join me in thanking Beth Seedorf. This is her baby, so thank you. And lastly, could you please join me in thanking Jim Obergefell and Rick Hodges for joining us tonight. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's great Thank to you. see you all. Thank you. Thanks.